In this lecture video, we're going to be talking about caffeine. And guess what? We're going to be talking about soda samples all over again. You've already done a lab using soda, and this was the phosphate in soda lab that you did a little while back on our ion chromatography experiment. Well, the issue here is that caffeine, well, it's not an ion. Okay, this thing does not carry a full positive, and it doesn't carry a full negative. It is an organic compound. And this This organic compound is in many of the sodas that you drink on a daily basis. And for this reason, we've already talked about cola. We've already went through those uh, theory concepts in the IC videos, and I'm not going to rehash it here, but we are focused on a different property of that cola drink. And this property is a different type of molecule. This molecule is an organic molecule, and because of that, it cannot be analyzed on the IC system. It has to be analyzed on the HPLC system instead. All right, now what about GC? Okay, can caffeine be analyzed on the GC? And the answer is no, right? Caffeine is not really made to be injected on the GC system. And the reason is because caffeine is not very volatile. Caffeine is a powder. It is a white powder. It loves to stay on the countertop if you spill it on there, or you better not be spilling it on the balances, but it will not go away. It's not going to just evaporate. And we've talked to properties of GC molecules. They are very volatile. They have very low boiling points. They're typically organic, but at the same time, they're either going to be gases or they're going to be liquids that can turn easily into a gas to be injected on that machine. Now, is the answer absolutely not? No. We can do some things to caffeine to get it to behave in a GC system, but this is a lot of trouble. It's a lot of problems, and who wants to go through that step, right? I want something quick. I want something easy, and that is where HPLC comes into play. So in this particular lab, you're going to be analyzing soda, and you're going to be analyzing soda for caffeine, and we're going to be doing that on HPLC because the IC system is not suitable and the GC system is not suitable. All right. Now, the background here in the lab document, I would like for you to read that on your own. I'm not going to talk about it too much. I mean, that's really for you to read. I don't need to rehash it for you, right? You can do this during your own time. But we're going to be using an HPLC instrument to take a look at caffeine in different types of soda. The purpose here, here's the structure for caffeine, right there we go. And if you take a look at the structure of caffeine, what I want to talk about this structure is that there is some delocalization in it, all right? And delocalization is basically this concept of a double bond and a single bond and a double bond. And any time that we can see these double bonds, multiple ones of them, especially in a delocalized or what we would call a conjugated system, then this will do very well in the field of UV. Okay, so with these organic molecules, they normally do have some UV absorbance. And the reason is because organic molecules are somewhat complicated. They bring with them multiple functional groups. And these functional groups, you can automatically see them in the caffeine structure, especially if you've taken an organic chemistry class at this point. Okay, so let's just focus on a couple of these. Uh, first is this general area right in here, this double, single, double all the way around. This is a nitrogenous base that's right there. I see some nitrogen in the rings. I also see nitrogen in the bigger ring that sits over here to the left. But that double, single, double area does a very good job to get caffeine to be seen in an instrument. Not only that, but we also have this double bond O. I know it's not a conjugated system, but it is a double bond, and that double bond does help for this molecule to be seen in a UV vis detector. So what we're going to do is we're going to pair the HPLC instrument up with the UV vis detector. The reason I'm stressing this so much is because we have different HPLC instruments in our laboratory. We have an HPLC instrument that is connected to a a refractive index instrument, right? That's not really suitable here. Refractive index, yeah, caffeine's got a refractive index. 
The problem is that that refractive index has to be super, super high concentrations for the detector to actually see and distinguish it apart. And this is just not very good. I mean, caffeine is there. Caffeine is present. We know it's there. We're talking about milligrams of it, but I don't want anything that needs to be super concentrated. So refractive index, I just don't really use unless I absolutely have to, or unless another detector doesn't work for me. And with this field, UV does a very good job for caffeine. So there's the structure. You're probably going to see a question devoted to the structure of caffeine, and there you go. Uh, if you look at some of the properties of caffeine, it's over here to the right-hand side. The structure of caffeine is given. The molecular mass is given to you as well here. Uh, the density and the melting point. So notice the melting point's 235 to 238. So this could melt. It could turn into a liquid. Um, is that liquid suitable, again, for a GC? Well, the GC goes up to about 350 degrees Celsius. We can get this stuff to turn into a liquid. Can we get it to turn into a gas? Well, that really depends on the method that you're going to do from it at that point in time. All right. So this is why we're saying GC is not the best option out here for me. It really is HPLC out of the chromatography world. All right, so the instrumentation that you're going to be using is our Shimatsu LC20. And the Shimatsu LC20 was, I would say, one of the first uh, modern HPLC systems that we had integrated into the laboratory at that particular time. Uh, it's been around with us for quite some time. The LC20s are still used in a laboratory. That model is still made. Uh, they've probably changed the front covers of them to make them look a little bit prettier and a little bit more modern. Uh, but the technology and the system is pretty much the same that we have as well. Uh, this has an auto sampler unit on it. The auto sampler is called an SILHTC. This is not an LC20 auto sampler. This auto sampler was meant for some of the older HPLC systems that they manufactured, uh, but we got a really good deal on it and we could still connect it to this Shimatsu LC20 and it would still recognize it uh, and it would still begin to inject samples on it. So for that reason, it's free and we could use it, so we took it. And that's why we have an older auto sampler from Shimatsu paired with a Shimatsu HPLC that's a little bit newer. The column here uh, is a short res tech. Um, I'm going to not give you dimensions here. The instructors will know which uh, dimension of column that needs to be installed on this instrument. Uh, but as long as you are aware that it is the short res tech column, uh, almost like a tester is what we use here. And the reason is because it's a really, really short column, okay? And it doesn't take long for caffeine to come in and caffeine to come out. Uh, we're talking about just a couple of minutes and that is it. If we chose any other type of column, on this machine, then that particular type of column would give us longer retention times and that could be wasteful as far as time is concerned. So this method is typically ran with our very short ResTech column uh, and it's like a little bitty baby column, super, super little, about the size of your finger as far as the length is concerned. The supplies, what do you need here? Well, we need caffeine, of course, because we need to make some standards. We need some methanol and water for what we call our mobile phase. And our mobile phase is what's going to be pushing through the instrument and pushing our soda samples through the instrument. We need some HPLC vials so we can load our samples up with them. Uh, we also need some pipettes and some flask because we're going to be required to make standards, uh, which will include the quality control standard and the uh, calibration check standard. And of course, we also need a soda sample. And that soda sample has to be flat or decarbonated. So if we have not done this for you, then this is something that you will have to do on your own. Sample preparation. Uh, if you take a look at the standard preparation, uh, they're basically giving you directions in the lab procedure about what you need to do in order to weigh out and dissolve. I mean, it's a very clear-cut, straightforward process. It tells me to take 40 milligrams of caffeine. I'm going to put it into a 100 mil volumetric flask. I'm going to record the exact mass, and then I'm going to add distilled water to the mark. I'm going to shake it up. I'm going to make sure that it mixes completely, and I should get a very clear 
solution. So caffeine does dissolve NDI water, okay? And it will produce a 400 part per million caffeine standard for me. The reason that I do that is because part per million is milligram per liter, and there's a 40 milligram, and 100 mils is actually 0.1 liter, so 40 divided by 0.1 is 400, as the math over here tells you. That's how we get that number. So this is what we would call maybe our stock or our working solution, right? And then from that 400, we are going to be required to make a series of standards, 20, 40, 60, 80, and a 100. So in the worksheet, it's going to ask you for a little bit of math. It's going to say, how did you dilute these down to make what you needed? And that includes a dilution equation. So if you've taken our standards and solution class before, that dilution class or equation is CV equals CV. The concentration here is typically what I start with, which is my 400. The volume, I need to calculate. I want to know how much of that do I need to use in order to get where I'm going. Okay, well, where are you going? What is that concentration that you're trying to end up with? That's that second C. Well, let's do the 100. And how much volume would you like to make of that? Well, this really depends on you. You don't need to make a lot. If I read the directions, it says diluting from the 400, make 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100, and show calculations on how you prepped these standards. Never does it specifically tell me how much. They're going to let me make up that decision on my own, right? So let's just say we want to make 100 mils of this. All right, that's it. You could have made 50 you could have made 25, you could have made 10. Those HPLC vials, they only really need one or two milliliters in order to cap them full. So 10 milliliters would be perfectly enough. So let's just go ahead and change that number, right? Just so that you know that we can do it. I've changed my mind. I don't want to do 100. I want to do 10 because I don't want to be wasteful. All right, that's perfectly fine. So 400 times X is 400 X equals 100 times 10 is going to be 1,000. And to solve for X, you would divide by 400. This is how we would solve that dilution equation, right? So 1,000 divided by 400. Well, goodness gracious, if you need a calculator, I can pull that up so you can walk through it. 1,000 divided by 400. I hit enter, and that tells me 2.5, all right? Okay, so X is equal to 2.5 mils. What that means is I'm going to take 2.5 milliliters of the 400 ppm solution, and I'm going to put that into a volumetric flask, 2.5 mils, down here in the bottom. And then, because I'm making 10, I'm going to dilute up to the line with DI water. I'm going to invert it. I'm going to mix it really well before I take it fully up to the line, and then I tap it off or top it off uh, after I get finished with it. So you're going to have to do that calculation for each one, the 100, the 80, the 60, the 40, and the 20. And we're going to label these as C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5. The C basically means caffeine. So my first caffeine standard, my second caffeine standard, my third caffeine standard, and so forth. Uh, check the laboratory before you begin because sometimes we will prep these for you. Not only that, but these will be pre-analyzed on the HPLC machine to save you a little bit of time. So instead of getting everyone to make their own set of standards, which is sometimes good, the purpose here, though, is not to check your standard prep. The purpose here is to get you acquainted with the HPLC instrument and how to run samples on it. So these standards could already be prepared. So just double check them before you go through and do the extra work. If you want to do the extra work, be my guest. Do it. Uh, however, save you some time, save you some elbow grease, and um, use what the lab has prepped for you. As far as the samples go, you're going to be given a sample of soda. We're not really going to tell you which one it is right off the bat. We don't want you to kind of pinpoint in on the caffeine amount. Uh, we'll tell you after this gets analyzed. But this particular type of soda needs to be flat. And flat means you've got to get rid of all the bubbles. Okay, You've got to let this uh, soda sit out for a little bit so that way it will go flat and there's 
no more fizz to it or foamy to it, okay? Uh, no one really wants to drink those soda samples, uh, but we love to analyze those soda samples in a laboratory. Well, if you do this a couple of days before, you can just open the bottle, pour it into a beaker, and just let it sit out. Uh, the issue, though, is that sometimes we don't have that time, and you can accelerate this decarbonation because that's what we're doing here. We are decarbonating the sample. You can accelerate that decarbonation by literally pouring it from one beaker to the next very very often and very, very quick. Uh, this will help expel any of the CO2 gas that might still be in your sample. And as you're pouring it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, it's literally kind of like shaking up the bottle and allowing all of that carbonation to escape. So that's up to you. Uh, however you want to handle this, I don't have a problem with it, but most of you will probably be pouring it like a bartender back and forth between two different beakers. Once you decarbonate it, we're then going to dilute it and we're going to dilute it by half. Okay, so if you take a 10 milliliter volumetric sample of soda, then you are going to add 10 milliliters of water uh, to that soda sample. And it's got to be DI or distilled water. Okay, uh, if you take 5 milliliters of soda, you're going to add 5 milliliters of water. Okay, get my drift. If you take 50 mils of soda, you're going to take 50 mils of water. That is diluting it or cutting it by half every single time. And you need to do this on three separate runs. Okay, we're going to run these things in triplicates. So you're going to have a soda 1, a soda 2, and a soda 3. All of those are in reference to the same soda sample that you have made individually from each other okay do not take 10 and 10 mix these two things together and say well I'm gonna be clever I don't want to do all that work so I'm gonna put some in one HPLC vial some into a second HPLC vial and some into a third HPLC vial no you do not do that they needs to be three separate soda samples and we're gonna know the machine is gonna tattle on you because you cannot be that close uh, with your numbers as far as your sample prep is concerned. It will be almost identical here, and we know something fishy has happened if you've decided to do this. So if you do the 10 and 10, this will be sample number one, and you put it in one HPLC vial. And then you'll go back and you'll do a number two again, and then you'll do a number three all over again. So make sure that you follow those set of rules, or we'll get you to go back if we have questionable uh, data will get you to go back and you'll have to remake them and reanalyze them and stall for time. All right, so that's going to be S1, S2, and S3. Uh, this area here that is marked out, this is letting you know that you can do tea and you can do coffee. We've just had better results with soda. We think it's easier. Uh, there's hardly any other contaminant that shows up in the chromatogram. So because of that, we've traditionally gravitated towards soda samples again for this particular lab procedure, but we could have easily brought in tea and brewed it and had you do this. We could have easily brought in coffee and brewed it and had you to do coffee as well in order to measure the amount of caffeine that's on the inside. Uh, in addition to that, Soda typically provides us with the milligrams of caffeine that we can find in that particular type of sample. So we have a very good number to compare our results to. Sometimes tea and coffee make that information a little bit harder to find. Uh, or they're very wishy-washy. They give you a big range, and we don't really like ranges. We want a number that we can compare our results to. And soda does a very good job to give us those numbers. The quality control sample, this is going to be prepped by the lab, and you're going to treat this just as you did your soda. So with this particular type of sample, you are still going to dilute it just like you did your soda sample. And again, this is a 50% dilution. So it's really up to you. Again, the HPLC vial will only hold one or two milliliters. So maybe cap it at 10 mils uh, in total. So five milliliters of your QC sample, five milliliters of water, put it into a 10 mil volumetric flask, make sure it's up to the line, give it a good mix, and this will be pretty good for your quality control sample.
you will not know the concentration of that quality control sample. That is up to you to figure out, and it's up to you to report back to us. And then we will look at that number, and we will clear you out on whether or not your data makes sense. Okay? The calibration check standard, uh, this is just a standard. It's kind of like a quality control standard, but you have made it. No one else has made it. So this is a concentration that is known to you because you made it while you were in the lab. That is the calibration check. So this calibration check, you're going to look at your standards and your standards typically are going to go from 20 to 100 part per million. You want something in between here. Okay, it doesn't really matter what it is, but it cannot be another standard. Meaning it can't be 20, 40, uh, 60, 80, or 100. Those are standards that you've ran and that you've analyzed as far as the calibration curve is concerned. What you need to do here is pick a different number. So you need to go with like a 25 or a 30 or a 45 or maybe a 50. Something that does not show up as far as concentration of the standards go. You will make this on your own, and you will make it from the 400 part per million here. So going back to that 400 part per million stock, you will take some of that 400 ppm. You will use that to make the calibration check standard that is required in this particular part of the procedure. So this concentration is up to you. You tell me what you want to make, and you will run it, and hopefully what you run will be what you have made. That way we can ensure that we have some really good data that's coming from the machine. The analysis on the HPLC instrument, uh, this is a UV instrument um, as far as detector goes, and we have to make sure that we put in the proper setting of the UV vis detector. That proper setting is 273 nanometers, so this uh, area is where caffeine really shows absorbance very well, and any other number we might see caffeine, but it's not going to be as sensitive. Uh, in addition to that, 273 is also very good because not too many things that will be in that soda sample will show up. Uh, they will have different absorbances. They will be seen by the UV detector at different wavelengths. And if we hone in on 273, which is really good for caffeine and maybe not so good for the other stuff, we can sometimes eliminate the other stuff that might be in the soda sample and it will not show up on the chromatogram. So that's why it's very important to pick the proper number as far as the UV vis detector is concerned. The runtime here is five minutes per sample. The injection amount, we're going to go with 10 microliters. The flow rate is going to be 0.7 milliliters a minute. And the mobile face here is a methanol and water mix at 47 to 53% respectively. Methanol and water is a very common mobile face for HPLC. It's typically what we see very often in almost every single lab. The issue here is what percentage. The percentages are what will change. And in this particular method, 47 and 53. This is also what we would call an isocratic run. And an isocratic run means nothing's getting changed. The way that I start is the way that it ends. So I start with 47 and 53. I end with 47 and 53, right? I start with 0.7 flow rate. I end with 0.7 flow rate. So these are the settings on the HPLC instrument. When you analyze your data and when you analyze your samples, you want to make sure that you are using the proper method with these particular parameters uh, that are here. All right. Uh, so there's your settings on the HPLC system. What's coming next is just a order of uh, the way we would like for you to run your standards and your samples. You don't have to follow this, but very often these are going to be provided to you in a standard operating procedure when you work for a company. So they're saying vial 1 is going to be a DI rinse just to make sure everything is cleaned out. Vial 2 through vial 6 are going to be your standards from lowest to highest most of the time. Then we're going to go back to vial 1 and we're going to tell the instrument to inject that DI water again. Just just helps flush out any of the higher concentration caffeine from the sample that I'm getting ready to run. 
then 7 through 9 are going to be the samples, and then the QC sample that we've made, and then the CC sample that you've made, and then finally we end it by flushing it out once more with a DI water rinse and allowing the mobile phase just to pump through for another 5 minutes so we can ensure that this method and this analysis is cleaned out for the next person. All right, so this is your uh, example of what we would call the batch table because this is a batch of your samples. Now, if the standards are already made, if the standards are already analyzed, you do not have to do this initial part. Vial 1 through 6 will already be done for you. You can hop right on this DI water and then start injecting your samples in your QC and your CC. All right. Uh, here at the bottom of the document, you're going to see a table, and this table is going to list some very common sodas that we might bring into the lab, and it's also going to tell you how much caffeine there is per serving. Now, the issue here is that the serving size is typically provided to you in ounces, but we don't really like to work with ounces. We like to work with milliliters. So 591, I believe, is the typical serving size as far as a 12 ounce uh, sample of drink goes okay uh, if you take a look uh, Mountain Dew Diet Mountain Dew Mellow Yellow and Surge typically are going to have the highest amount of caffeine off of what I would call the normal soda samples uh, Coke and Diet Coke Mr. Pibb Dr. Pepper all of these are much lower but if you're really wanting a caffeine jolt then these are the ones that you probably need to go to during that time in addition uh, what you're not seeing on this table is something like Sundrop and a Sundrop sample really fits in this area as well so it has a very large amount of caffeine compared to the other soda samples so take home message with the table here's a summary we might bring you one of these we might not but probably more than likely it will be one of the ones on the table your serving size is 12 ounces but we're going to have to convert that over because we need it in milliliters we do not need it in ounces and this gives me a number to go by an actual value of a target of what my data should be if I analyze these soda samples the proper way so now that we've talked about the lab procedure and the concept of what we're doing, I want to pull up a spreadsheet and I want to walk you through some of the calculations that's going to be required. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is an example of the student template or the spreadsheet that I've provided to you in the course. And it's like any of the other templates that you've seen before in the past that you've completed. Uh, so up here in the middle of the spreadsheet, you're going to see an area to put your calibration data. All right, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. And just like always with all of the other labs that we've looked for as far as chromatogram is concerned, we're looking for areas that show up on the instrument or on the chromatogram. So these areas get keyed in, the parts per million are already there for you, and the only thing that you'll have to do is do a linear calibration curve over here to the right hand side. You'll end up getting y equals mx plus b, and this will give you the equation, and this equation of course is going to be filled here in the linear regression line, as well as the correlation coefficient, which is the r squared value. So that is the information that needs to go into the spreadsheet, and you'll need that information in order to solve for all of your samples that you have ran on the HPLC. Name of the soft drink, uh, the name of the soft drink, do not forget to fill in this block so that way we know what you've analyzed and then over here to the left hand side the name S1, S2 and S3. So these are your triplicates from the soda and those triplicates will have a chromatogram each one will have their own and you need to fill in the areas that's associated with those samples. These areas will then be plugged into that regression line, right? Now the way that you plot this curve is concentration is on the X and on the Y, that is the area number. That's how we've structured the calibration curve. So area is the Y and concentration is the X. So this area needs to be plugged in for the Y variable. So Y equals MX plus B and you solve for X. So area gets plugged in for Y, you'll know that number. M, which is your slope, you'll know that number. 
B, which is your y-intercept, you'll know that number. It's given to you when you do your calibration curve data and you're solving for x, which is the concentration that you will plug in to these areas in this column. Okay. The undiluted part per million, well, this is the whole concept that you diluted that soda before you ran it, right? So the way that you diluted it is you diluted it by 50%, half. So what you need to do in order to go from this column to this one is you need to multiply by 2. Uh, the reason is because you need to double up. You cut the concentration in half before you ran it on HPLC because it would have been too much. So when you do the undiluted, you can go through that back dilution equation, CV equals CV and all of that mess. But why do you do that? If you know that you cut it in half, the concentration just needs to get doubled in this step. So save you a little bit of work, just multiply those numbers by two and you've got it. The serving size in milliliter, I've already pre-filled that in for you. That's 591 mils. And what this column is after is the amount in milligram, actual milligram of caffeine. All right, so how would I do that calculation? It seems like this is always kind of the problem area that people get to. Well, this undiluted part per million. Let's just say that this is a 100. A 100 ppm is what I'll get in this undiluted column. Well, that 100 ppm means 100 milligrams per liter of soda. The issue here is that a liter is not the serving size. We want to know how much is in the serving size. Therefore, we want to know how many milligrams are there contained in 0.591 liters of soda because the serving size is 591 mil. When I convert that to liter, that's 0.591. So I'll bring my calculator up again. This is just a ratio one more time. If 100 is in a liter, how many would be in 0.591 liters? So I'm going to take 100 and I'm going to multiply by 0.591 and that gives me 59.1 and that is equal 59.1 is equal to 1 in front of that x times 1 with the liter, and that's x. So to do that calculation, if my concentration was 100 in the first line, I basically take that, multiply by 0.591, and I will get a milligram value here. So 59.1 is what I would end up with. 59.1 actual milligrams of caffeine in that serving size. Okay, we're talking about actual amounts, we're not talking about concentrations. The theory milligram, well, it's pre filled in the table for you based on what we've normally provided in the past. That's 114. And then to calculate the error percentage, well, that is your actual minus your theory of what it should be divide it by the theory of what it should be times 100. That 100 is included because you're calculating for a percentage. I would also tell you to put absolute value here in front. Uh, that way your error will always be a positive number. If you don't, you'll get a negative error. Uh, it normally isn't, um, we don't really care if it shows up negative. But the issue here is that I'm also wanting you to do an average. And if you are coming out with negative error on one side and positive error on the other, they could cancel each other out and it will actually tell you that you're perfect. So we like to convert this error into a positive number when possible. It just basically means are you over or are you under? If you're under, you typically come out with a negative error. So convert that over to an absolute value number, which just means get rid of the negative. That's all that you've got to do. Okay. So then you'll average it and you'll do a standard deviation. Finally, over here to the right hand side, the QC and the CC are similar. The QC, you're going to have an area number. You're going to solve it just like you did your soda sample. The CC is also going to have an area number. You solve that just like you so solve your soda sample. 
Uh, you're going to get part per million that's going to be popping out of that equation. And then you'll have to back dilute again, that undiluted part per million. Well, here's the key, though, uh, almost a trick. The QC had to get diluted, right? And you diluted this the same way that you diluted the soda. You did it by 50%. So I'm going to take this part per million. I'm going to multiply by 2 to give me the undiluted part per million. With the continuing calibration check, the CC, you did not dilute this one. All right, you did not dilute it and make it weaker. You made the CC at a concentration that you want it to run. You added it to the HPLC deval and you ran it on the HPLC instrument. So this PPM is actually going to be the same as the original PPM from the instrument. And the reason is because you did not dilute it any further. You made the check, you ran the check. You did not dilute the check after you made it. Right? This was a full-blown direct run, and because of that, you really don't have a undiluted PPM. They are the same number. Uh, the actual values for this particular year are going to be located here. Uh, these numbers could change depending on what you have analyzed and what we've given you. Uh, so 150 and 30, it just so happens to be the numbers that are pre-plugged into the spreadsheet. And then you'll calculate the error again, just like you calculated the error over here with your soda samples all right uh, so there's a little bit about the calculations hopefully that will help you through some of the calculation work especially this horrendous milligram column that people typically get so confused over it's just the concept that we are taking a concentration and we are calculating actual amounts from that concentration that's there all right, so there's your spreadsheet, very similar to all of the others. I don't think that you'll have a problem. If you do, you know how to get a hold of me. Send me an email, show up to office hours. I'll be glad to help you out. Uh, so good luck with the HPLC Caffeine Intro Lab, and uh, we'll do more HPLC labs after this one. Uh, so this is just getting our feet wet. So good luck. I don't think that you'll need it. Give me an A, make me happy, and make your average happy.